Thank you for that wonderful introduction and the invitation to speak. It's really a great honor to, to be here. Can everybody hear me or should I talk louder? Okay, great. Uh, I don't know about brilliant. I think it's a vast exaggeration, but certainly I became acquainted with Sergey's uh, fantastic work on Descends and Enfant and other uh, graphs and knots, you know, right around the time when I was a postdoc at Michigan State. So it's finally great to make your acquaintance. So I submitted the sexy title of Geometry in the Shape of Space. I, I'm glad that it got you all to come to the talk, and now that you're here, I can, you know, bore you with the mundane details. And the mundane details is, you know, this is really going to be an introductory talk about geometry and topology and their interactions. But I recognize that you guys are coming from a number of different, uh, you know, areas of pure and applied math, so I'm going to try to keep this as non-technical as possible. If at some point something gets confusing, please interrupt me and ask questions. I honestly uh, love it when people do that. At the same time, part of the cost of keeping things accessible and non-technical is occasionally some stuff will be vague and hand wavy. I will occasionally also try to kind of intersperse precise technical statements. Hopefully it's not going to be too jarring going back and forth, but you know, by all means, you know, stop me if you need something clarified or firmed up because it's, you know, the, there are too many hand wavy words on the slide. So with that, um, preamble. Let's uh, get started. So geometry and topology, if you're not used to the distinction between them, let me try to explain. So geometry, well, we've all studied it in high school, if not earlier. It's the science of measurement. We're used to studying geometry on a flat plane or sometimes maybe in three-dimensional space, but definitely a big feature of what's going to come up uh, in this talk is that, you know, you can also do geometry in curved spaces. It's still the science of measuring distances and angles and areas and volumes and all the, you know, geometry, all the measurement of the Earth, but those measurements will change in a pretty significant way if you stretch the underlying space. If you take one of the sheets that's over there in the picture and, you know, grab a little piece of it with your fingers and start pulling it, well, it's still going to be a nice sheet, it's still going to be a surface, but definitely the geometry of it will change. What will not change is the topology. Topology is the science of things that are insensitive to stretching. So, for instance, um, now this is sort of what I feel like uh, every morning when my you know, one and a half year old wakes up and needs 5,000 things done for her. Um, the question of how many handles are on this mug is a topological question. If I you know, start reshaping the mug before it was cast, it still has three different handles. Similarly, other questions of topology are, you know, is it compact? Is it, you know, does it fit in a bounded space? Does it consist of, you know, a single piece or many pieces? Is it connected? Those are topological questions. And a good topologist's mantra that you may have heard at various times is, a coffee cup is a donut. This was a saying for many years, and various people found it funny, various people found it corny and not funny, until my friend Henry Siegerman decided to actually take that topologist joke and cast it in, you know, 3D printed material. So the picture, oh, is, is there a laser here? The, you know, the picture over here is an honest coffee cup, and the next one is a coffee cup slightly reshaped, where maybe, you know, the bottom of the cup is not as deep, and the next one it's, you know, reshaped further, where there's barely any indentation, and through kind of progressive reshaping, you know, it becomes an honest-to-goodness donut. So because you can stretch one into the other, they're topologically the same. The technical word is homeomorphic. You know, same topology. We can't tell the difference between them. All right, so a little bit of preamble. Let's uh, talk about surfaces. I just attended about four different talks on surfaces and branched covers among them, and I know many of you were there, so certainly you've seen an introduction. Um, surfaces are spaces that are locally just like R2. Just like means homeomorphic, so a little neighborhood of a point on your surface uh, is just like a neighborhood of a point in the plane. And a good way to think about it is not if you're looking at a surface from above, but if you're living within it intrinsically, and if you're a bug exploring a surface, what makes it a surface is that there are two perpendicular directions where you can move. You have two degrees of freedom. So a surface is a two-manifold, and the whippersnappers among you can generalize that to a definition of an n-manifold, where you have n different degrees of freedom and n different orthogonal directions where we can move. We're going to get up to dimension three in the stock, but not higher. So um, that's a surface. 
Um, surfaces come in all sorts of places. For instance, a surface is the underlying topological space where you play the game of Snake. That picture, I was very happy to find it on the web. The very first cell phone that I had looked exactly like that. It was, you know, one of the <laughs> very, very early Nokias. Um, maybe, you know, some of you guys are too young to have actually seen one of those phones, you know, in the flesh or in the plastic, but it was, you know, it was about this big. And um, it came with exactly one fun piece of entertainment, which was the game of Snake. And the game has this feature that if you walk off the left side of the screen here, sort of the start of the snake, you come back from the right side of the screen. And there's the snake demonstrating that. If you walk off the top side of the stream, the screen, you come back from the bottom. Um, that makes it a surface because any point of the world that the snake inhabits has a neighborhood just like a neighborhood in a plane. So if you take a point kind of on the edge here, there's a half disk over to its right, and that's glued to a point over there that has a half disk over to its left. Those half disks get combined together to make a whole disk. And you can do something similar at the corners where four different pizza slices make, you know, a single pizza. So every point in this world has a neighborhood that's just like a piece of the plane that makes it a surface. The question is, which one? So there's a very lovely classification of surfaces. Uh, they're classified by genus or the number of holes. So every surface, technically that means, you know, compact and without boundary. Every surface is homeomorphic to either a sphere or a torus with one hole. That's a genus one surface, a torus with two holes, torus with three holes, and so on. The number of holes or handles in this surface kind of tell you what topological type it is. Anyone want to take a guess for the snake? Yeah, it's a torus. Right. How do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, so if you take you know, a piece of paper, if you take your rectangular screen and actually make it out of something bendable, you can actually stretch the, you know, roll the piece of paper around to glue the top to the, uh, to the bottom, and then it takes a little bit more crinkling to get the other sides together, but you can actually make a torus out of it. What I find particularly instructive about the game of Snake, though, is that, the, you know, the snake doesn't know it's on a torus, and it's, you know, playing this game, you don't really feel like you're on a torus. You're thinking about the surface intrinsically rather than looking at it from the outside the way that you look from the surface of a donut. And when we start thinking about uh, three-dimensional manifolds, then there's not really any good way to look at them from outside unless you know how to kind of step into a fourth dimension. So imagining it from within is much more helpful for kind of getting intuition about the subject. Okay, so there's the game of snake on a torus. Um, let's think about geometry of surfaces. So I'm going to be interested par in particular in geometry in metrics, ways to measure distance on a surface that are homogeneous, which means that any pair of points look the same geometrically. For any point here and any point over there, there's an isometry, there's a distance preserving transformation that maps this point over here to that point over there. So all points have neighborhoods that are geometrically exactly the same. And if you stipulate that condition, then there are actually only three geometries in dimension three. So there's Euclidean geometry, which, you know, is characterized by having a flat plane of curvature zero. And of course, you know, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. You've all known this for many, many years, that the three angles of a triangle in the Euclidean plane add up to pi. What you might not have known is that that feature is actually equivalent to saying that there is no curvature, that the plane is flat. And this Euclidean geometry, it's in the middle of the screen because it's the middle of the two other, it's the middle of the three. There are two other kind of geometries bracketing it. One fairly familiar, which is spherical geometry. You know, many of us who traveled here on a plane experienced spherical geometry on the way over here where if you're trying to fly between, let's say, you know, Boston and Seattle are the two cities, you know, at the two corners over here, you don't go directly east, but you sort of go first, first north and then east and then come a little bit south because that's the shortest way to travel. The arc, the, the shortest arc between these two points is called a geodesic. In the case of a sphere, it's sort of a great circle, but the important thing is that for any pair of points on a sphere, there is a shortest path between them. 
so that's the analog of lines in the plane. You can make triangles and other figures out of those um, lines. And you can do all the stuff that you're used to doing on a plane, just in spherical geometry. And it turns out this, that suddenly this condition that the three angles of a triangle add up to pi, well, it no longer holds. They add up to more than pi, and in fact, how much more than pi depends on the size of the triangle. The bigger the triangle, the bigger the angle sum. And in fact, there's this kind of beautiful formula relating them that the area of a triangle is just the angle sum minus pi. So certainly one feature that you see immediately is in the Euclidean plane, you have scaling. You can take a triangle or you can take any other figure and just you know, scale it up by a factor of two, scale it up by a factor of 10. Its size changes, its shape doesn't change. In uh, spherical geometry, size and shape are completely uh, in interwoven. One determines the other to a large extent. So the, the size of a triangle determine, uh, determines the angle sum. You can't scale things. So on the opposite end is negatively curved geometry. If we were to look at it from outside, every point would look like a saddle. And you know, I, I'm not going to give you the exact formula for the metric on the disk that, uh, that gives you that shape, but if you want to draw pictures, uh, the relevant thing is that straight lines in this geometry are arcs of circles that are perpendicular to the boundary of the disk. And you can make triangles and other shapes out of, that, um, out of those lines. And it has the opposite feature compared to what you're used to in, uh, in, in spherical geometry, where now the angles of a triangle add up to less than pi. Triangles are skinny in negatively curved geometry. Uh, and again, the, the area of a triangle is determined by its angle sum, but sort of in the opposite way, where the smaller the angle sum, the bigger the area of the triangle. Okay, so that's a little bit of qualitative stuff about the geometry. Let's talk about geodesics, because this is going to be kind of a useful way to tell what kind of geometry you're in. So geodesics are just the analog of straight lines in a curved geometry. For any pair of points, you just sort of construct the shortest distance path between them, and that's a geodesic. They always exist locally, and in these nice geometries, they exist globally. And the interesting thing about geodesics in spherical geometry is they start out separating and then they come back together. So, of course, I stole this picture from The Little Prince, and if you read the caption at the bottom of the screen, which is very, very hard to read because it's so tiny, it says that the prince is tending to his volcano, but let's pretend that he's not tending to his volcano and that he's holding a, a hockey stick or a golf club and trying to play some sort of game where he's, you know, aiming a ball at a point on the other side of the planet. Well, the playing you know, golf or pool or bowling on a positively curved planet is actually a pretty forgiving game because if the prince has slightly bad aim, as long as kind of his target is way on the other side, then making a little bit of a mistake to the left or right is not that big a deal because the, uh, the geodesics are going to come back together. If in fact, if the point he's aiming at is directly diametrically opposite, then it really doesn't matter what direction he aims it. But, you know, anywhere slightly closer, it's still a somewhat forgiving game. Um, as you might expect, with kind of negatively curved geometry being opposite of positively curved geometry, it has the opposite qualitative feature. So geodesics or straight lines in hyperbolic geometry separate, and in fact, they separate extremely fast. They separate much faster than they would in the Euclidean plane. So now imagine that you're playing you know, golf in the hyperbolic plane, and you're aiming at a hole that's 100 yards away, and you hit the golf ball, but you hit it just one degree off target. Well, you're aiming 100 yards away. You're, you hit it just one degree off target. If you were doing this in the Euclidean world, you know, one out of 100, you'd be roughly kind of one yard off when the ball gets over there. In the hyperbolic plane, if you did exactly the same thing, you hit the ball one degree off target at a place that's 100 units away, you would end up 199 hyperbolic units from your goal. So the geodesic separates so fast that you're, in fact, diametrically opposite of where you want it to be, um, even though you started just one degree off. 
Uh, I'm mentioning all of this because, of course, part of the goal here is to kind of see what the universe is like topologically, and the way that geodesics scatter or come together is going to be kind of part of the data that you can collect to, to get that information. How are we doing so far? Is this making sense? OK. So relating geometry and topology together, we saw a classification of surfaces. They're all classified by genus or the number of holes. Well, it turns out that different topologies of surfaces are equipped with different geometries. So the sphere, of course, is equipped with spherical geometry. There's not really much to say about that. You know, it is already kind of the, the model where spherical geometry lives. The torus, or surface of genus 1, is naturally adapted to Euclidean geometry, where this is the other reason why it's better to think of the game of snake as living on a rectangular screen rather than on a donut-shaped torus, because you can't actually take a rectangular piece of paper and bend it and stretch it so that it wraps around the surface of a donut. But you can imagine performing the gluings abstractly, where this blue line over here is glued abstractly to that blue line over here. This red line over here is glued to that red line over there. And then making those identifications gives you a torus, and it equips the torus with a Euclidean metric. If you have a way to measure distances in the Euclidean plane, then you also have a way of measuring distances on the quotient, just as long as you don't step too far away. So if you're measuring distances by figuring out the length of a path, then any path on the torus kind of lifts to a path up here in the plane, and you can measure its length, and you can measure distances on the torus in that way. So the sphere is adapted to spherical geometry. The torus is adapted to Euclidean geometry. And all the other surfaces, starting with genus 2 onward, two or more handles, are adapted to hyperbolic geometry, where you can take a polygon in the hyperbolic plane and glue opposites, or not, well, you could glue opposite sides, or you could glue colored sides the way that they're shown here. So this red line is glued to that red line. This blue line is glued to that blue line, and so on. Exercise, if you do that, all the vertices will become identified to one single point, which means that if you want the gluing to work nicely in a geometric way, then you want an angle of 45 degrees at the corners, because there's eight corners, 45 degrees on each, then you'll have 360 degrees around a whole circle, and, and the gluing will work nicely. I'm skipping the part about the side lengths also working nicely, but if you take a regular polygon where all the sides are the same, then you know, all the gluings will not distort the lengths of sides. And if the angles are 45 degrees, then they will also not distort the angles, and everything will glue up very, very nicely, and you get a hyperbolic metric on a genus 2 surface. So you can do exactly the same procedure for all surfaces with even more genus, three handles, four handles, five handles, and so on. So one takeaway from this exercise is that, at least in dimension two, at least for surfaces, hyperbolic geometry is the generic geometry. It's sort of the one that's most prevalent to the extent that all but finitely many surfaces are adapted to that geometry. What we're going to see in dimension three is hyperbolic geometry is also generic, but maybe in a, you know, in a more subtle way. It's not quite all but finitely many examples. All right, so I talked about um, geodesic light scattering, and I talked about playing pool, but that's you know, maybe a little bit hard to visualize. So let's um, um, change gears for a moment and actually kind of see what it's like in the flesh. So let's try, at least with a mouse, to play pool on a torus. So First of all, much like um, that slide a couple of pages ago, sorry, uh, here, much like the slide a couple of pages ago, if you're standing on a torus and you're, and you're here, you, you can see copies, here, let me make this larger, you, 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 know, you can see copies of yourself in many other places. If you're here, you can also see yourself here and here and over there. If you're on a torus and trying to shoot at a bunch of 
pool balls, well, there are no railings on this billiard table, so a ball can keep on, rail keep on rolling until it runs out of steam, or if there's no friction, it can keep rolling indefinitely. It can just keep rolling around the torus again and try to get into the hole. As you can see, I'm not very adept at pool, especially with a trackpad. Okay, well, there's one. Um, so, you know, aiming in this game is not especially easy or especially hard, but let's change the topology. Let's try to do the same thing on a sphere. So here's our spherical geometry. It um, takes a little bit of getting used to. One thing, one feature of spherical geometry, by the way, is that as you move around and come back to where you started, the position of your hand has changed. So technically, you have come back to the same point, but kind of your tangent vector is no longer pointing to wh where it used to be pointing. So that makes it harder to get used to. Okay, let me try to aim. So there are your balls flying around, and as they come back toward the hole, their, uh, the spherical geometry tends to pull them in, so the game is supposed to be more forgiving, but maybe my bad aim will kind of ruin the experiment. <laughs> All right, maybe I should let you folks play with this afterwards and decide for yourself whether it's easier or harder than on a torus. I assure you, though, it is distinctly harder in the hyperbolic plane. So again, you see many, many copies of the same picture, but notice how the ones kind of toward the outside look really far away and much smaller. That's because, you know, your geodesics are scattering, and the kind of the visual angle of standing at a point and looking at that group of balls has become really, really tiny. And it make, become, makes aim also very hard. So I'm going to attempt to do this. Okay, hang on. No. Okay, I guess I'll just aim at this bunch of balls at the bottom, but that will simultaneously aim the, uh, another copy of the ball toward the group of balls in the center. And they scatter all over the place and don't come anywhere near this hole. Half, half the time, I, I, you know, if you're shooting from far enough away, you miss the cluster of pool balls entirely. So whiffing entirely in this game is um, totally standard. Uh, let's see, maybe one more demo for a couple of minutes. You can try to play a maze where a mouse needs to find a cheese. So playing a maze game on a torus is not so bad, but it's actually very, very good for getting used to the topology of the torus. So here's my mouse. I can walk off the left side of the screen and come back again from the right, and you know, finding the way from the mouse to the cheese is not terribly hard. Uh, doing this on double torus's surface of, let's say, genus two, so you can see many copies of the mouse, and you can see many copies of the cheese, but seeing it is not all that helpful. <laughs> where, okay, where is, you know, we're going here, and my hand orientation has gotten messed up, so we're going here. All right, anyone have suggestions for where we should go next? <laughs> Let me try to scroll the world a little bit, which, okay, apart from the the fun of playing these games, sort of the serious point, is that the boundaries of the piece of paper or the boundaries of the screen that we saw when playing Snake are completely artificial. We could take those and, uh, and, and slide them along, it will still be the torus. It doesn't matter where you draw the lines that you use to identify the piece of paper to make it a torus. So similarly here, you can scroll your whole world along, you're still in the same world. Okay, so now that I've scrolled it, I think I see where the cheese is, now we just need to get up there. Okay, so there you go. 
at the end of the talk, I'll give you the website where you can download all these things. Or if you're bored right now and you have a laptop in front of you, the address is geometrygames.org. And you get to do a lot of these topological games. All right, back to supposedly serious math. OK. So this is going to be a little bit anticlimactic, because I motivated spherical geometry by saying, well, look at the geometry of the Earth, and look how planes fly around it. But imagine yourself living you know, two or 3,000 years ago on some Greek island, and you want to understand what the Earth is like. You want to understand the topology of the Earth in modern language. But you know, maybe the same way to ask the question in simpler words is you're trying to understand kind of what the extent of the Earth is like. You would like to know, for instance, you know, is it finite or infinite? Can you actually walk to the edge of it somewhere? I absolutely love this picture that you know, I dug up somewhere of an explorer getting all the way to the, you know, to the celestial sphere and sticking his head outside of it. So you know, is there something beyond the, the world that we live in? Um, part of the reason that's relevant is you know, once we get up to dimension three, you know, people very much ask the question of you know, can you get to the edge of the universe, or, you know, or is it infinite? Or in fact, are there other possibilities? It's finite, but you know, it just has more complicated topology. So OK, is the Earth bounded or infinite? And similarly, you know, is, it, uh, is it flat or is it curved? If you're standing on an island and watching boats sail away from you, well, eventually the boats get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then they disappear. But are they disappearing because they're going underneath the horizon? Yes. Or are they disappearing you know, because our sight is not very good, and, you know, and it gets hazy, and you just can't see them anymore? So this is maybe what it would be like for the boat sailing away on a flat plane and just disappearing because we can't see them. And a somewhat you know, wilder question, because this is a topology talk, is you know, does the Earth have complicated topology? Maybe this is what it would be like to have a map of the Earth projected onto a you know, genus 2 surface with multiple handles. Well, if all you know is what the 20-mile you know, radius around you looks like, then you can't definitively rule that out. You, know, you need to know some more global information. Of course, nowadays we have all sorts of pictures of the Earth from space, and well, it's kind of anti anticlimactic to, to say that it's a sphere. But it's still interesting to see exactly how the Greeks solved that problem, because the solution is very impressive. It's very elegant. And the solution uses geometry to determine topology in a way that we can sort of try to bootstrap one dimension higher. So, I think the solution to this problem is due to Eratosthenes. And he performed a really clever experiment. He lived in Alexandria, which is at the very north of Egypt. And Alexandria is not quite in the tropics. In the summer, the sun gets high, but it doesn't quite get vertical. It doesn't get quite you know, 90 degrees uh, above the horizon. But when he traveled to the south of Egypt, to the city of Syene, that is in the tropics. So on the longest day of the year, the sun shines directly vertically down a well. The sun, the sun is completely perpendicular. So paying attention to that observation, he said, OK, well, that must mean that the Earth itself has to curve between the two locations. Because in you know, the sun's rays are coming in very nearly parallel. But in Alexandria, they're off at an angle. In Syene, they're vertical. That means that the Earth itself is curved. And if you measure the angle, then that also tells you the angle by which the Earth has curved. So that tells you that the Earth is, in fact, curved rather than flat. At that point, he made an inference rather than a scientific experiment. He said, OK, well, if it's curved like by this angle in Egypt, where I live, it must mean that it's curved by about the same angle everywhere else. The curvature is everywhere the same. So he concluded that the Earth actually has positive curvature, making it spherical. Another way to say it is that if you look at ships sailing away from you at an island in all sorts of different, in every direction, they will disappear downward. So the Earth is curving the same way in every direction. It's positively curved. And what's even better is by measuring the distance between Alexandria and Syene, 
supposedly by paying somebody to ride on a donkey and count the steps, sorry, on a camel, and, ride the, and count the steps of the camel between the two cities, or so the legend goes. He measured the distance, he measured the angle, he did a little bit of basic geometry, the, the Greeks were good at that, and he actually calculated the radius of the Earth to within 1% of the correct value, which is pretty darn impressive. An even more impressive thing is, hey, we're in the city of Columbus, so when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, turns out that, you know, uh, the information from Eratosthenes was, uh, was somehow lost to the, to the sands of time, and he used, you know, bad information that I think came from Ptolemy, and the size of the Earth that he thought was correct is actually 30% smaller than, you know, what's true, which is why he thought he landed in India. So, moral of the story is, you know, you shouldn't burn the Library of Alexandria, and you should actually <laughs> keep the information that you've learned. All right, that's dimension two. Let's change gears to dimension three. So a two-manifold was a space where you could travel in two perpendicular directions. You had two degrees of freedom. So just take two and replace it by three. A three-manifold is a space that's locally just like R3. Any point has a neighborhood that's homeomorphic to a little neighborhood in R3. And a bug flying around a three-manifold or a spaceship flying around a three-manifold can fly in three different perpendicular directions. And much like you can play snake on a rectangular screen where the right, si right side of the screen is abstractly glued to the left side of the screen, you could play three-dimensional snake on a three-dimensional screen where opposite sides are identified. So the front A is glued to the back A, the top B is glued to the bottom B, the left C is glued to the right C of the cube. That gives you a three-manifold. Every point of that space has a neighborhood that looks like a ball in three-dimensional space. But of course, there are many other three-manifolds. There are many other, just like there were many other surfaces, there are many different topologies of three-manifolds. This is just one of the simplest. This is called the three torus. And what's pretty remarkable is it's only slightly more than a decade ago that we really got our first complete list in any reasonable sense of all of them. The list is not nearly quite so simple as, you know, surface with one hole, surface with two holes, surface with three holes, but there is a procedure you could program it to a, into a computer. The computer will run for an infinite period of time, but eventually, you know, every 10 minutes or so, it'll churn out a new entry on the list, and if you let it run forever, eventually it'll spit out every three manifold exactly once. So we do have a list in a weak sort of sense. And what's even cooler that you know, I'll tell you about in a moment is that in order to bring some sort of structure to the list, in order to understand it and organize it, geometry really gives you the only reasonable way to, to organize the list. And one reason why we care, certainly this is the kind of where the abstract of the talk came from, is that the universe that we inhabit is a three-dimensional manifold. We can, you know, fly off into space and we have three different perpendicular directions in which we could travel. We'd like to know what manifold it is, where it actually fits on the list. And that's becoming a practically tractable problem more or less for the first time ever, you know, right around now. So, Imagine you're, you know, flying around the universe, you're seeing all sorts of galaxies. Of course, to actually do this, you would have to go far faster than we can actually travel, but, you know, imagine you're going at the speed of light or close to it. All these galaxies are flying by you, and, you know, maybe you're seeing similar-looking galaxies over and over again. Maybe you think that, you know, maybe you're really seeing the same one over and over again because you're traveling around some topologically complicated universe the same way that, you know, the snake was traveling a, around a topologically complicated screen. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we even get there, you know, we want to know, can you even reach the edge the same way that, you know, that explorer kind of poked his head out from under the celestial sphere, sphere of stars? Can you get to the edge of the universe? You know, is it flat or is it curved? All these questions that made sense for the Earth that we might think are very easy for the Earth, well, they make sense for the three-dimensional universe that we live in, and they're much harder, and I think they're much more exciting. Well, I'd like to know what's the three-dimensional topological structure of the universe, and, you know, I'm not an astronomer or a physicist, so here's kind of a Wikipedia 
version of the question. Um, there are some satellites up right now gathering data. They're gathering data about how the universe is curved. Turns out that, you know, curvature is related to mass density in a way that I don't fully understand because I'm not a physicist, but apparently they can get information about how massive various distant objects are. That tells them information about how curved the universe is. Uh, it's pretty close to flat, but it might be slightly positively curved. And based on its curvature, we might be able to tell you what the topology is, much like Eratosthenes did for the Earth. But, you know, how to go from one to the other, how to go from, you know, curvature and other geometrical data into topological data is actually not so easy, and that's sort of what the, the rest of the talk is about, is that the theoretical tools, the theorems that will interpret the actual astronomical data are very much still in development. Okay, so geometry in three dimensions. Uh, in two dimensions, we saw that there was positively curved spherical geometry. There was flat Euclidean geometry. That's the one we're used to. There's negatively curved hyperbolic geometry. All those still have analogs in dimension three. There's five more weird ones that are sort of not constant curvature. They curve different amounts in different directions. It'll take a little bit more time than we have to describe those. But let me just give you a picture of the most important one of the bunch. This is you know, hyperbolic three space kind of viewed from inside. Your lines of sight are following three-dimensional uh, geodesics. So one feature that you see here is, you know, you're staring at a pentagon with all right angles. Normally, in the Euclidean plane, you can't possibly draw a pentagon with all right angles. It wouldn't fit, but in the hyperbolic plane, angles are smaller, objects are thinner than they are in the Euclidean world, so it's feasible. And in fact, this is only one of many, many, many right-angled pentagons that you see here. They fit together nicely to give you um, a three-dimensional dodecahedra. So there are 12-sided 12 12 polyhedra where every side is a, is a pentagon. Those fit together nicely to, to tile three space. And if you look at the symmetries of this tiling, there's an infinite group of symmetries. There's an infinite number of ways to map one uh, polyhedron to some other, and by exploring uh, those symmetries, you can actually take a quotient and get interesting three-dimensional manifolds. Okay, so here's the complicated classification theorem that we're working toward. I promised you there would be a couple of technical slides. This is one of them, but I tried to make it as non-technical as feasible. So for every surface, each one was adapted to one out of the three geometries. The situation in dimension three is a little more complicated, uh, but it turns out that to get down to shapes that are adapted to different geometries, you need to cut an arbitrary manifold into pieces, but there's a canonical way to do that. You know, given any nice manifold that you hand me, there's a procedure for cutting it up into shapes where each of the shapes has a geometric structure, each of the shapes has a way to measure distances that comes from one of the eight standard geometries. And for each one, there's actually a way to enumerate, to write down a list of all the manifolds that have that geometry. There are typically infinitely many. There are infinitely many for each of the eight geometries, but for each one, kind of, there's a structure to the list. There's a, a way to, um, to organize the manifolds on it. By far, the vast majority of these are hyperbolic. If you start writing down a list in any reasonable way, almost all the manifolds that you'll come al along will have hyperbolic geometry, just like almost all the surfaces had hyperbolic geometry, but it's not quite all but finitely many. It's more like almost all numbers are composite. You know, you start writing down integers, the primes become more and more and more rare. Almost all numbers you see are composite, but there's still infinitely many exceptions. You know, same thing here. There's infinitely many exceptions, but those ex exceptions are becoming less and less and less frequent, and, you know, almost everything on the list is hyperbolic. Oh, sorry, this is really the third bullet that I'm talking you through. And it does give you a classification um, by something called a fundamental group. If you've seen it, great. If you haven't, there's a way to attach an algebraic object. There's a way to attach a group to a space called a fundamental group. And the amazing thing is that in dimension three, this gives you almost all the information with kind of 
very rare exceptions. If you know the group, then you also know the space that's associated to you. So, so it really is a classification. Um, okay, maybe that's a little bit abstract. Let's change gears again and think about what it's like to live in the different three-dimensional universes. We can actually fly through them. Okay, so here we are living in a three-dimensional torus. That space where, here, you took a cube, you glued opposite sides together, and you got um, a three-dimensional torus, the three-dimensional analog of the surface where the snake lives. But these walls that you're seeing are kind of artificial. They don't actually exist in the space. They're just kind of how you cut it up into manageable pieces in, or, in order to fit into our standard R3 where we're used to thinking. So I'm going to take them away for a moment and just fly through the space. So we're flying along, flying along. If you like, you can see many copies of the spaceship that we're flying. I find it a little bit distracting, but there's the, the spaceship that we're on, and we're actually seeing other copies of it. There are many copies of the Earth flying by us, and notice how they're organized in these infinite lines. They're organized in these infinite geodesics. It's because to get from one to the next to the next to the next, you're following a kind of a geodesic, you're following a straight line that cuts through the walls of the space. So take the spaceship away and let's change the geometry. Okay. So here's the same thing in positively curved or spherical geometry. And notice what's happening now. There is an Earth far away from us that looks like it's getting smaller. And for a moment there, it occupied the entire kind of back of our field of vision. So that Earth, uh, okay, you, you can't see where I'm pointing. That Earth over here is getting smaller as it's getting uh, closer to it, to us. Okay, or this one over here, it's getting closer to us but it looks like it's getting smaller. That's because of the feature of the lines of sight separating and then coming back together again. So even though it's very far away from us, if the lines of sight are converging, then it looks kind of big from our field of vision. So one kind of notable qualitative feature from what, uh, in this positively curved spherical universe compared to what you saw, whoa, crash into the Earth. <laughs> All right, I'm glad some people are awake. That crash actually uh, woke up a couple folks. Uh, one notably different qualitative feature is that you're seeing more Earths and it looks like they're closer to you. Again, that's because of the lines of sight coming together, the geodesics converging, the game of um, golf or pool being forgiving, that objects that are actually relatively far away look pretty big. They look like they're pretty close uh, to you. Uh, they're pretty densely packed in. And if you stare at the picture hard enough, you can actually start seeing some spherical geodesics as well. So let me see if I, so for instance, this one and this one and this one and that one and that one over there are all arranged crash uh, along a spherical geodesic. So maybe if you could actually conduct an experiment where you flew through the universe really fast and looked at some really large object and could see the same object in many different directions just by kind of measuring how big or how small it, it looks as you're looking at it from different perspectives, you know, that would give you some information about the curvature of three-dimensional space. And just for contrast, let's see what the same thing looks in hyperbolic space. Uh, Oh, sorry, uh, I forgot one thing. Okay, the, the walls are artificial, but if you wanted to see them, what this, this is something called the dodecahedral space, where if you take a dodecahedron and identify opposite sides, you get the, the three-dimensional manifold that this inhabits. Okay, hyperbolic world, 
also something that you can build out of a dodecahedron. This is the same example that you saw a moment ago with the uh, the right angled pentagons, only not static. Now we can actually fly through it. Wait, oh, so sorry, this was the same spherical one. I apologize. Uh, this one. There we go. Big qualitative difference, right? Instead of tons of Earths really close to you, they're much more sparse. They look like they're far away, although some of the ones that look like they're really far away, like this tiny one over here, they're not actually far. They're coming at you pretty fast, but they look like they're very tiny because your lines of sight are actually diverging so fast. It's sort of like you know, driving a car and looking in the side of your mirror, and they say you know, objects are closer than they appear because of the curvature of the mirror. Here, objects are closer than they appear because of the curvature of the um, ambient space. So that's definitely one qualitative difference, is that things look very, very tiny and far away, even when they aren't. Let's see what else can we see here. Let's maybe see the, the dodecahedron that this is based on. Of course, it makes very, very pretty patterns. But again, if you're um, standing at one of the faces of the dodecahedron here, let me pause it here, it's the same basic shape that the spherical dodecahedron was based on, but because of the curvature's face, the opposite face looks like it's really, really tiny. Okay, so that's a little bit of the qualitative difference between kind of flat and spherical and hyperbolic three-dimensional geometry. Again, the best kind of data, the best evidence that we have is that the universe is either flat or slightly positively curved. Um, from my point of view, that's a little bit of a boring answer because I'm a hyperbolic geometer and because hyperbolic geometry is so rich and interesting. But you know, there's always a chance. There's very much error of measurement that you know the error bars around the best guess are big enough that it could actually turn out to be negatively curved. We don't know. So I apologize for the rest of the talk. You know, this is sort of where the universe ends and the pure math takes over completely. But I have to relate it to the stuff that I do somehow. So here's a very, very cool theorem about three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. Um, we saw that when we constructed metrics on surfaces, that for instance, to get a Euclidean metric on a torus, well, you took a piece of paper and glued opposite sides together. But you didn't have to take a rectangular piece of paper. You could have taken a parallelogram of a different shape, and it would still work. Those metrics are still uh, you know, all adapted to the torus. Or you could just take a bigger piece of paper or a smaller piece of paper. You can scale things in Euclidean geometry. In hyperbolic geometry, especially in, in dimension three, you can't do any of these things. This is a very, very powerful um, rigidity theorem that says that if you have a metric of constant negative curvature, if you have a hyperbolic metric on a manifold of dimension three or higher, but uh, you know, three is good enough for this talk, then it's actually unique. Then, it's, then there's only one. And this result is powerful because a bunch of things follow from it. It tells you that ge uh, all geometric measurements, all geometric structures are completely determined by the topology of how you glued it up together. So any geometric measurement that you take, you know, volume is the most basic thing. You know, what's the total volume in the space that you inhabit? What is the length of some geodesic that starts and ends at the same point? Uh, what's you know, the area of a surface inhabited in your uh, manifold? All geometric measurements actually are determined by the topology only. And OK, this is not strictly speaking a cons consequence of the theorem, but it's also true and also interacts with it, is that if you know the volume, then you almost know the manifold. There are only finitely many that can share the same volume. So basically, geometry and topology determine one another. There's, if you know geometric information, like you know, volume plus a few other things, you can determine the topology. If you know topological information, then at least abstractly, at least theoretically, you ought to know the geometry. So the picture, by the way, here is you know, one of these polyhedra into which you cut up the space. There's a canonical way to do that. So, um, you build some sort of three-dimensional manifold by gluing this red face to that red face, you know, this purple one to 
that purple one and the, they're all matched up in pairs to give you some sort of manifold. So geometry and topology, generally speaking, determine one another. D uh, data about geometric measurements determines what the topological type is and vice versa, but that's only abstract. This is only kind of an existence theorem about this kind of correspondence. And what would be very interesting and very powerful and is very much an area of active research is actually trying to do this in a concrete way and in a usable way. Can you actually predict what kind of geometric features you know, translate into topology? If your volume is big, what other topological measurement has to be big? If, uh, you know, if, if you have really, really big surfaces in your space, what kind of geometric measurement has to be big or small corresponding to that? And th these questions of prediction are closely related to questions of computation, because a lot of times if you have you know, a manifold handed to you as a bunch of tetrahedra glued together or in some other way uh, that you want to encode into a computer, for algorithms to run, turns out that you need you know, geometric estimates. So we'd like to do this uh, to translate geometric data into topological data in a way that's predictable and in a way that's computable. And there's actually some new theorems that can, you know, just very recently have become available that can actually do that, that tell you, maybe relating this back to the universe, that if you take, if you measure the volume of the universe, what sort of, you know, topological type can it possibly be? So here's one, uh, you know, on the next two slides, I'll illustrate a couple of sample results in this vein, and then, you know, and then we'll stop. So one uh, class of manifolds for which you can do this are uh, called fiber bundles over the circle. Maybe that's too complicated a name. They're mapping tori. They're constructed from surfaces in a very, very nice way. So the you know, it's not too hard to visualize. You take a surface, you thicken it, so you, you have a product of a surface and an interval, and then you glue the bottom side to the top side. And it turns out that there are many ways to glue. You need some sort of gluing map. You need some gluing homeomorphism. Homeomorphism just means, you know, one to one and onto continuous map. So you've glued the top to bottom by some homeomorphism. The choice of homeomorphism tells you what three manifold you will get in the end. And almost always, if the gluing map is complicated enough, you'll almost always get something hyperbolic because hyperbolic geometry is abundant. And you can actually predict the geometry of the space that you construct from the data of how you've constructed the gluing. I apologize that I'm stating the theorem in a slightly um, vague fashion, but there is a way to measure the topological complexity of this gluing map, and this topological complexity is proportional to the volume of the three manifold that you get, or proportional up to a little bit of bounded error. So the moral is that the complexity of how you do the gluing tells you the size of the manifold that you get. Uh, it also tells you other related information. For instance, it tells you how long or short um, the closed geodesics will be in the space, these uh, closed curves. So you can get a lot of geometric information directly from uh, the gluing data. Or if you want to go in the other direction, if you're still trying to measure the shape of the universe and the universe turns out to be hyperbolic and we know its volume, then you know, theorems of the state will tell you that you know, if the volume is small, then the topological complexity is also small in you know, the following explicit way. So that's one realm where you can prove things like this. A different realm is uh, the world of knot complements. Here's my one picture of a knot for the stock. I realize I've disappointed a couple of people who wanted to see more knot theory and were drawing you know, beautiful knot theoretic pictures earlier. So I think about knots in terms of their complements, in terms of the space that remains when you take a knot and remove it from R3, or if you want to be fancy, from the three sphere. Here's a nice picture of a knot complement. It's what you get if you take an apple or some other you know, round solid and have a worm eat a knotted tunnel out of that apple. It's a knot complement. And these objects are of fundamental importance, not only because they're easy to draw and visualize, but also because this is kind of a way to get access to arbitrary three manifolds. There's a 
surgical procedure called Dane surgery, where you can remove knots in space and glue them back in by some other way. Doing this repeatedly can let you construct any arbitrary three manifold, so we'd like to understand knot complements for that reason as well. And it turns out you can predict their geometry in terms of the, the picture of the knot that you started with. So for, for, for knots and for their complements, you can predict their three-dimensional geometry by drawing a diagram of this knot, by drawing a picture of it on a two-dimensional screen, and just counting the number of times where strands of the knot wrap around each other in this way. And you know, the theorem, again, stated in a slightly vague way, is that the number of regions of that type where the knot wraps around itself is a measurement of volume. It predicts the volume of the complement up to bounded error. So those are two situations where purely topological information um, actually tells you geometry in a kind of concrete and measurable way. So uh, as we stop, here's a couple of references for reading more information about this. If you like the vaguely told story about bugs crawling on surfaces and flying through universes with some very deep math behind it, the book to read is The Shape of Space. It's written in a very, very non-technical way, um, but it's, it's a very fun read, and it's actually quite deep. If you want something you know, a little bit more advanced, then this book is also kind of maybe at the level of a first-year graduate course. It's still very, very readable, and, you know, and Bill Thurston invented a lot of the math that um, went into this and is also a beautiful writer. And here's the website where you can download all the games. Thanks for your time.